happy Saturday, Risers. Sagar and I are back to take another look at some of our favorite segments from this week. We spoke with Michael Brooks, host, of course, of The Michael Brooks Show, about the New York Times smear of Cenk Uger. Jimmy Dore joined us to discuss the lead-up to this week's impeachment vote in the House. And Unite Here Local 11 co-president Ada Briseño talked to us about the labor strike that almost canceled this week's Democratic debate. And yet, Sagar did not even come up at that Democratic debate. I know. Ridiculous. And with the final debate of 2019, impeachment vote happening all in a week, it offered us very opportunities to take a look into the increasingly splintered Democratic Party. Let's start with a debate over health care. Former health care executive Wendell Potter, he joined us earlier in the week to talk about Andrew Yang's health care proposals, but he also touched on why America needs radical change to our health care system and why he thinks Medicare for all is the only solution. The, the reality is that, you know, we have multiple health, private health insurance companies that most of them uh, now these days are, are for profit. Uh, their, their singular goal is to enhance shareholder value, uh, to make as much money as possible, and they're doing quite well at that. What they cannot do is control health care cost. Uh, it's just structurally impossible the way that we have a system for private insurance companies to do that. It, as long as you have uh, insurance companies uh, so, supposedly competing for business, uh, none of them is big enough to really negotiate favorably with big hospital companies or drug companies is just not possible. The other thing is they don't really want to at the end of the day because uh, as healthcare prices go up on the delivery side, they're able to increase premiums to cover, to more than offset the increase in, uh, in healthcare costs on the delivery side. So we're all paying for that. That's why you've seen these incredible increases in health insurance premiums over the years. We just can't afford it anymore. Yeah, I think he makes a great point that you really can't yeah. tinker around the margins here. If you're serious about health care, you've got to be willing to fight the industry. And he makes good We're not just talking about the health insurance industry. Hospitals, providers, you have to make sure that you are fundamentally reshaping that entire industry. And so when um, Andrew came out with his health care plan, he had at the beginning of his mm -hmm. campaign embraced Medicare for all. Um, he even ran ads saying that he supports Medicare for all. He still says he supports Medicare for all in spirit. But what he actually released was a much more narrow set of reforms. It was a narrow set of reforms. It was kind of targeted at lowering price. And I don't disagree with that. But, I mean, you're right, which is ultimately you got to meet the voters where they are. And I think people significantly underestimate just how much of the Democratic primary is for a Medicare for all system. That's why yeah. Bernie is overwhelmingly trusted. And I think the Republican Party underestimates this very much to their own peril. I mean, if you look at the broad polling of Medicare for all, everyone always says, yeah, but throw in, you know, the employer thing. Even when you throw that in, it's like 52 percent of the country. Yeah. So I do think that some sort of compromise solution has to be reached here. And I'm not sure that Yang's plan rises to what the Democratic primary electorate is looking for. Well, I was just looking at some yeah. polling, uh, NBC News, I believe, polling that showed support for Medicare for all within the Democratic primary electorate That's huge. has actually gone up right. over the past couple of months, which is, of course, completely counter to the mainstream narrative that you hear that, oh, it's taking on water and, oh, the candidates who supported it, they all got hurt in the polls. No, those candidates got hurt in the polls when they moved away from it. Meanwhile, who's right. trusted most? in the Democratic primary on health care, consistently it's always Bernie Sanders because he has been the champion of that legislation consistently yeah. from the beginning. So um, always interesting to talk to Wendell, though, because he has such a depth of knowledge and experience. Later in the week, Alexandra Rojas from Justice Democrats also stopped by the set to talk about her group and what they are up to. They're working, of course, to push a progressive agenda in the Democratic Party. A major focus of our discussion was on the Justice Dems' efforts to combat DCCC-backed moderates in battleground districts. She explained why the establishment's strategy is failing. It's a very real problem, yeah. right, for working class candidates to be able to have at least even the attempt of access to the same resources that maybe traditionally supported Democrat candidates or folks that can self-fund their campaigns do. So right off the bat, it's just hurting the infrastructure that supports regular people from entering the halls of Congress. Um, but it has uh, backfired in some way in that there's a whole uh, swell of different think tanks, groups, consultants that want to support candidates like Cara Eastman, right, uh, down in Nebraska, that want to support candidates like Jessica Cisneros, because they see in this moment, right, where we have to defeat the most corrupt president of this time, we need champions in Congress that are still, regardless of who is president, going to fight for Medicare for all 
all going to fight for a Green New Deal. Um, and it's really important that we remind voters, right, that this time period uh, before the general election is where we get to decide the direction of where we want the party to go. Yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly interesting. I think it really just demonstrate what she was laying out there was, you know, in reaction also to the DCCC recruiting of Jeff Andrew, who ended up switching over to the uh, to the Republican side, endorsed by President Trump uh, in the Oval Office. So I do Says, think, and 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 Jeff Andrew pledged his quote undying support <laughs> to Donald Trump, and right. you know this is, and every time a progressive gets asked about their their loyalty to the Democratic Party. Just play people that moment of a corporate, centrist, DCCC backed candidate who's no one ever questioned his loyalty going and pledging his undying loyalty yeah. to Donald Trump. I thought that one was funny. <laughs> All right, finally, we return to our conversation with 2020 candidate Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard. We spoke with her about her decision to vote present during Wednesday's impeachment vote. Let's take a listen. Uh, I came to that conclusion that I could not, in good conscience, uh, vote either yes or no. You know, a, a no vote was unacceptable to me because Donald Trump is absolutely guilty of wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. uh, a yes vote was unacceptable to me because uh, impeachment should never come about as a, uh, a culmination of a highly partisan process. You know, this is something that our founders warned us about. That Alexander, Alexander Hamilton, he wrote very clearly about how um, his, his concern that impeachment, the impeachment outcome would be determined by the strength of one party or another rather than by an examination of innocence or guilt. People were very upset oh, about yeah. Tulsi's decision to vote present. And I get it. I really do, because there's such emotion around this president for legitimate reasons, for reasons that people feel like he's done real harm to the republic. And even AOC said, for you to show up and vote present was to fail at leadership. I'm paraphrasing. Mm. This isn't exactly it. But when I listened to her explain it, I think it really took a lot of courage to take that stand because Congresswoman Gabbard has been a consistent critic of the impeachment yeah. process. She's very worried about the divisiveness in the country and the tribal nature of how this all played out. So to vote yes on impeachment, given her critique, given her concerns about that process, wouldn't be true to her principles. But then to vote no right. and give the president a free pass and basically co-sign on the Republican idea that his actions have been perfect also isn't a reflection of her values because she is, in fact, deeply troubled by his presidency and by his actions. So mm -hmm. she took a principled stand in voting present. And, and look, you only need to look at how much hell she's caught for doing it to know how much courage this took. I thought it was a very courageous move, and it was a courageous principle stand for actual democratic disagreement, which is that she, like you said, she did not agree with the Republican side. She thought that what was wrong, like she said, she's like, I'm running to defeat him, but I believe in the democratic process, and impeachment is such a violation of that process, especially when, you know, on something like Ukraine that so many people will feel so that it was so fundamentally out of step with what they voted for, that she was like, I'm just gonna stick to the election. And I think that, I mean, that takes so much courage when the entire party establishment is against you. That's what she's done her entire career. And she might be the most principled, courageous person in the US Congress. I seriously. think, that's, I think yeah. that's fair to say. I mean, look, I get it. I honestly don't know how I would vote. I would have been in a similar place as Tulsi, not sure how to send the right message yeah. to express my concerns with that they seized on this stupid Ukraine thing. <laughs> that not that, again, not that what he did was okay, but that there were so much worse actions you could have talked about that we've been wrapped up for months in this whole process, that the whole thing has been about protection of elites, protection of the national security's desire to be more aggressive against Russia. How do you express that but not give the president a free pass? So I, regardless of whether you support how she ultimately came down, I think you have to admit that she truly grappled with this and tried to come up with the right and principled decision. And once again, at great cost to herself, yeah. judging by the hell that she has taken, certainly online and in the press. Absolutely. Um, before we go, quick programming note, we're not going to have our usual weekly recap next Saturday, but 
But it being the holidays, of course, we don't want to leave you empty handed. So instead of the week, check back here next Saturday for a special edition of Rising Cues that does it for us. We're going to be back later today for our recurring segment with Katie Halper from Rolling Stone's Useful Idiots podcast. We break down the week that was in media mishaps. And tomorrow we're going to have another round of Rising Cues, as Sagar was just saying. So we will see you then. Enjoy, everybody. See you soon. See you guys.